Thank you, Congressman Johnson, and thank you all for coming. The purpose of this panel is to have an honest discussion about the state of mobile privacy. According to Justice Warren and Brandeis, privacy means the right to be let alone. Yet when it comes to our always on, always connected mobile devices, this 20th century notion is quickly becoming outdated. Indeed, many Americans wake up to their I love alarm clock, check the news from Flipboard, work out with Fitbit, listen to Spotify while walking, check deadlines thanks to Evernote, access sensitive files from Dropbox, uh, WhatsApp with friends, play wrestle with coworkers, Yelp a dinner spot, use Google Maps to get there, and then of course at some point in this busy app fill day, post a status update on Facebook. I could go on and on, but my point is that people want to share their lives on their, and on their mobile devices, and the mobile devices make it easy to do so. This doesn't mean that consumers don't care about privacy. It simply means that we just have to rethink what privacy is and how to protect it in the digital age. So fortunately, our panel includes a diverse group of hardworking people who care about privacy on our mobile device. We have with us today Michelle Demoy from Consumer Action, Travis LeBlanc from the Office of the Attorney General of California, Kevin Wasong from Lynn uh, Mobile uh, LLC, and then Tim Sparapani from the Application Developers Alliance. So let's start off by having the panelists tell us a little more about themselves and why they care about mobile privacy. Michelle? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Michelle Demoy. I'm a senior associate at Consumer Action, which is an, a 40-year-old national nonprofit based in San Francisco. We have a three-pronged approach to consumer education and engagement, and that is we do um, consumer education materials in five different languages, online and offline. We go into communities and um, do train the train around tables and those sorts of meetings with community-based organizations all across the country. And we have an advocacy presence here in Washington, D.C., and we work on a variety of issues that are pocketbook issues, as we call them, so housing, credit cards, banking, and privacy, which many people don't really think of as a pocketbook issue, but of course it is more and more. Um, my background is in um, being, I was a software engineer for a while for dot-coms, then I did website product marketing, then I did health policy and political consulting, and so here I am. Um, now working for the last five years on privacy and advocating for consumers. Um, our organization has long been interested in privacy. It started out mostly as workplace privacy issues, and that was a really narrow um, issue. But as we work with minority and underserved communities, I'm really glad actually the congressman brought up the, the disparities that exist in terms of um, you know, the fact that more percentages of minority and underserved populations access more and more services via mobile phones, and yet they're four times as likely to be victims of identity theft and mm -hmm. other, other privacy harms. So, um, you know, my job basically in, in the various roles that I play is to make sure that voice is heard. Um, and so we will continue to, to focus on that and, and the NTIA process and putting on different roundtables and meetings and also doing briefings for the constituents of, of people like Facebook and Google. Great. Travis? Hi. My name is Travis LeBlanc. I'm Special Assistant Attorney General of California and uh, a senior advisor to the Attorney General, uh, her primary advisor on technology issues. I'm happy to be here with you today on behalf of Attorney General Kamala Harris, uh, who unfortunately could not be here. Uh, you may know that California has a long history of being a trailblazer when it comes to uh, privacy protections. I would dare say that California has probably the strongest laws in the country when it comes to privacy. It was the first state to uh, have a do not call list. Um, it was the first state to require data breach notifications uh, by companies when uh, there's a breach of the personal data of consumers. Uh, it was the first state to require privacy policies. In fact, it's, it's the only state um, in the country right now that has a law that mandates that any commercial operator of a website or online service is required to post a privacy policy if it collects personally identifiable information from a Californian. These laws uh, have really helped California establish not only a framework itself for protecting privacy, which unlike in uh, the federal government is actually explicitly contained in the Constitution of the state of California, but it has also helped to establish a floor for privacy protections in the country. 
Uh, one of the things that we, you know, that, that we know about the internet and as well as um, the mobile ecosystem is that when you're, you know, it's very difficult for a company like Google or Apple or Facebook, choose, choose your tech giant or really any startup uh, that's in uh, the, the mobile space, to have one set of practices in California and a different set of practices in Texas and a different one in Florida. Now that's a cause for concern on the private side because you could potentially end up with 50 different laws giving you different regulations of what you have to do, but the general approach that the industry has taken is whatever state sets it, uh, it becomes the floor for everyone else in the country. And that's how we've ended up with privacy policies really on every website. It's because of a California law that was passed in, I think it's 2003 or 2004, uh, the California Online Privacy Protection Act, which has um, really set the floor in sort of transparency around privacy practices, uh, not only in the browser space, but we have been using it recently in the mobile space as well. Uh, and, and the reason we focused there is because privacy practices in the web slash browser space are actually a little different than those same practices in the mobile space. And I want to give you just a few examples. We found in 2011 uh, or so, as, as well as the Wall Street Journal, that there weren't, pri there weren't nearly as many privacy policies for mobile apps as there were for websites. Virtually every website had figured out uh, that they needed to have a privacy policy. But when you looked at mobile apps, at least in 2011, less than 50% had privacy policies. Uh, we see that, you know, starting in 2011, 2012, the privacy practices of mobile apps were different than browsers. Uh, apps were regularly starting to collect geolocation. That was something that the browser space really hadn't hit onto yet, and it's still, you know, sort of, uh, uh, of picking up, but it's getting closer in the browser space. So there was different kinds of personal data that was being collected by apps. Apps were running in the background on devices that people were using all the time. Typically, you know, you could have a tracker that could end up on a computer, but typically with the browser, when you left the website and moved on two days later or, or even 20 minutes later, you didn't have the app sort of watching what you were doing. You didn't have the browser watching what you were doing. With apps, we were seeing that, that happen. We were also seeing that in the app space, different again from the browser space, the security protections weren't necessarily the same. How many, you know, think of how many of you have downloaded security software for your mobile device and how often it gets updated. Uh, a lot of people don't have security software on their mobile device, yet they share more personal data on their mobile device uh, than anything else. And we also saw a huge rise between sort of 2010 uh, to now in the use of mobile devices, in particular smartphones, not only smartphones, but iPads, the introduction of, of tablets as well, sort of really embraced by uh, the, the average Californian and really the average American, and in particular by children. Children were using a lot of these mobile devices, and because they had phones with them, um, a, a lot more children and teenagers, uh, I should say both together, uh, they were able to use them without the same kind of oversight that you might have had when you had a computer that was in the house. And so we saw an embrace of adoption by them. We also saw an embrace by uh, a large numbers of minority communities, as the, the congressman also just mentioned. But one thing that we noticed is that they use them differently. Because if your only way to access the internet, if your primary means to access it is to uh, is through a mobile device, then you're using it for everything, for banking, um, as one example, but also to apply for jobs, right? You are, you know, you are using it for accessing the world differently, and we needed to make sure that the same protections that we have in the browser space are also applying over uh, to the mobile space. So for us, it meant it warranted. It's not to say that these were problems so much as it meant we needed to play closer attention to the mobile space, and as we seen the world go mobile, um, we've continued to focus our attention there. I think we're going to talk more later on about some of the activity that we have there, so I won't go into that now. But I, I do want to begin to start by ex at least explaining why we have focused on um, mobile privacy issues in particular. Thank you. Kevin? Uh, I'm Kevin Wasong. I'm the CEO of Lynn Mobile, and we are owned by Lynn Media. Uh, which is one of the fastest growing media companies, digital companies in the U.S. Uh, we own and operate 43 television stations across the country um, that are all affiliates of most of the major networks. Uh, you know, the main thing is being committed to innovation. And I think, um, you know, as I look at what's happening in the marketplace today and what we're seeing and the people that I'm here with uh, also representing the IAB, 
is that we look at uh, this access to content and professionally produced content, and that there's an ecosystem that I'm more focused on in terms of what I do on a day-by-day -day basis. Um, you know, essentially, consumers want relevancy. They want access to content and information, just as you were talking about. Uh, and they want it on every device across multiple screens. So privacy is of the utmost concern in terms of what we're looking at today and how it's being uh, handled um, both on a, a judiciary level and also on a commercial level and looking at how those pieces should be more separate than uh, intertwined together uh, is a critical aspect um, because in the end if we really start to regulate privacy in certain areas we end up stifling what's happening with technology and creativity and how this industry is moving along and this industry is growing at an incredibly rapid pace right now and it would be um, uh, I think it would be counter uh, to that innovation to uh, move forward with certain aspects of, of legislation that would uh, regulate that. So um, those really are the things that, that we're focused on today is, is that ability to uh, monetize the content that's developed by professional content producers across the country uh, and, uh, and build our businesses. Thank you. And Tim, tell us about the ADA, please. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Tim Sparapani. I am not John Potter. John is in the back, but John has asked me to stand in today. So you get the B team, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, take it up with the boss man in the back if you'd rather hear from him later. Um, I'm here to help explode the myth that somehow developers don't care about privacy or, or about consumers. Uh, my experience, having been in this industry for an awfully long time now and from its beginning, is really that Developers and consumers have incredibly aligned interests, and the myth that's out there that that is not the case is exactly that. It's a myth. So one of the things we've been doing at the Application Developers Alliance is going around the country and hearing directly from developers themselves, and they are everywhere. They're in every congressional district now. It's America's fastest growing, most dynamic industry. And what those developers are telling us over and over again is they wake up thinking about privacy, they spend all day thinking about how they're going to use data appropriately. And they finish their day thinking about privacy. And uh, anything that is to the contrary to that is exactly wrong. So let me stop there. But let me also say a couple things very quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you to the Congressional Internet Caucus for the opportunity to speak. And more importantly, thank you to Congressman Johnson uh, and his exquisite staffer, Slade, for having an open door. Uh, Slade has taken any number of meetings from us. He has heard many of the concerns of the developer community, and we appreciate uh, that opportunity to have an open and frank dialogue about how we can do better uh, as a community and how we can help uh, more completely and obviously align the interests of consumers and developers. Thanks, Heather. Thank you. And that leads me into my first question for Michelle. I, um, I often have friends tell me that when I explain that I deal with privacy issues and your personal information, well, they'll say, I have nothing to hide. Yeah. So what's your response to that, and what do consumers care about when it comes to privacy? Um, well, I'll, I'll sort of be presumptuous and speak for consumers, um, <laughs> but I can say that I've had that, a similar conversation, usually with somebody a little younger than myself, mm -hmm. and they say, what's the big deal, you know? And I think there's a disconnect between what people think a mobile device is and does and, and what it actually is and does. Um, you know, it's a really personal product. It, it goes with you wherever you go. Your kids play with it if you're like me. You sleep next to it. You know, you sort of have a personal relationship with this thing that is actually a small tracking device um, that is designed to deliver you advertising. And I think one of the disconnects is that people don't quite, you might read a lot of articles, but you may not quite understand how much of your information is being pulled whether it's from the carriers, whether it's from the app developers, whether it's from the ad networks. You know, there are certain restrictions, but there are all kinds of holes in those legally. And basically people, I think, are not aware of the, the sort of impact that that data can then have on them personally. So, for example, your data, your texts, your emails, your shopping habits, your credit score, all of those go into profiles that are very detailed and can include a lot of financial information and even health information. People that um, people may not always understand that and think they're protected. And all of those things will serve a purpose, and it's usually a monetary purpose. For example, um, inferences will be made about you. 
And now, you know, sometimes that's funny if people think, like, I've been um, somehow, because I think because I watch Glee, I was targeted as a gay man, <laughs> which I'm not. Um, but the point is that these inferences then go into other types of decisions that are available to people just for, for a small price. So employers may look at those inferences and decide whether you're somebody that's worth employing. Um, health insurance rates are, can be directly impacted by some of these profiles, say, saying that you are probably a smoker because all of your friends on Facebook are. Um, and so that sort of um, inference, there's also the practice of web lining, which I feel like you sort of alluded to, but it's where a minority population is identified by zip code, so location comes into it, and other records, and then given higher rates or, or less attractive rates for things like mortgages, um, include, and also car insurance and that, that sort of thing. So these are direct impacts on people um, that I think are, are sort of poorly understood um, by the, the public in general. Um, the other thing that comes into play is pricing disparities. And that's similar to web lining, but what it is is based on your location, and there have been studies that have shown if you are, um, your location is tracked to be in a poor neighborhood, you're actually give, given higher prices. Um, and this includes pharmaceuticals on, that you can buy online. Another th way that that occurs, the, the Wall Street Journal had a report about Mac users or Apple, Apple product users, which I would imagine there are a bunch in this room, are shown higher prices for things like hotels. So it's not that you're shown a higher price for a room, it's just that you're shown the higher priced rooms. And so those are the ones that you book. Well, I believe it was Orbitz that could deduce whether you were a Mac user and That's then right. based Which off Which is, that, a, is yes. a clear inference about who you are, um, even if somebody else bought your phone, for example. So I think the, the, that disconnect is something that consumer groups can try to address, but also is clearly very important in terms of the, the businesses themselves, whether it's app developers or platforms or even wireless carriers, they, I think, have done a very poor job of, of bridging this understanding gap. And part of that is the lack of transparency. You know, the work that we're doing in the NTIA is on mobile transparency. And of course, it's incredibly difficult to really convey information on this little tiny screen. But it's crucial. Mm -hmm. And the key to it, in my view, is that consumers should have the ability to compare privacy to make these companies compete on privacy. Because of course the innovation argument, while I understand it having worked in the tech industry, I think it, it's a little hollow because the truth is privacy is in fact innovation, right? There would be no internet without us trusting the internet to go on and do these things. And this is true of mobile apps. So I think raising to the surface the true collection and sharing that's going on um, on a mobile phone would be a, a huge first step in, in making that transparent to consumers, to, to bridging that sort of yes. conversation. Well, I'm actually going to then follow up and ask Kevin the next question, since you spoke about advertising and the huge role that it plays in the mobile ecosystem. Mm -hmm. So Kevin, how does your company balance the need, the need for notice and choice on the mobile screen in light of tracking technologies such as UDIDs, Wi-Fi addresses, and digital fingerprinting technologies? Well, I, I, I think first of all, we, we have to look at what is defined as PII. Okay. And, and decide uh, on how that information is being used. I, I want to address one thing, though, in terms of what you were saying. You know, Jason Weinstein in the previous panel said one thing, the market will act as a corrective force. And, and I think in our industry we've seen that happen, especially in the web over, over the years. And that's not saying that there, there shouldn't be oversight and diligence in terms of privacy as a whole. But at the same time, um, you know, a level of self-regulation and certainly having a level of trust is absolutely critical in this industry. So, uh, you know, for us, we do have privacy policies as they relate to our apps and as they relate to our websites. Uh, you know, we are considered the most trusted sources in information. We're the local news in many markets. So, uh, our information is, is, and that level of trust is absolutely critical. Now, as that applies to advertising for us, I, I think there certainly has to be a level of trust in terms of how information is used and also the definition, again, of PII. Um, from a targeting standpoint, knowing where somebody is um, mm -hmm. or knowing where a device is are two different things. I think that that's something that we, we really don't give enough recognition to. Um, you know, for, for us, when uh, you know that a mobile phone is somewhere, to be able to serve them a message that's relevant and contextual 
is absolutely critical. And I go back to our ecosystem and the partners that we have here, um, you know, from, from different companies that produce uh, professional content. You know, the content that we produce that runs on a mobile device costs the same amount of money for us to produce as it does for us to produce it for the news station or for the website. Uh, and advertising is absolutely critical to underwriting uh, the development of that professional content. So, um, you know, in, in the end, I think that level of self-regulation is going to be absolutely critical. I think the companies that are out there today, like the Facebooks and the Googles and uh, the four squares of the world, have a responsibility to, uh, to really maintain a level of trust, maintain a level and cognizant um, uh, respect for privacy because at the end of the day if somebody wants to go to you know the the next player out there uh, because they've lost that level of trust it's incredibly easy in this marketplace to do that today so well from self regulation to actual regulation <coughs> Travis there must be something in the California drinking water maybe it's those delicious <laughs> in and out burgers but it's a very privacy progressive state as you explained earlier so can you remind us of some of the, the Attorney General's key efforts within the past year and anything that you could say uh, on or off the record for us about future efforts? Um, you know, I, uh, I'm happy to speak about what California's done. We've done a lot when it comes to privacy in the last mm -hmm. year, in particular in the mobile ecosystem. And I'm going to focus on mobile because that's uh, the subject of this uh, symposium. But um, we uh, last year formed a privacy unit uh, in the Attorney General's office, um, one of the first in the nation where we dedicated resources of our prosecutors to investigate and prosecute uh, violations of federal and state uh, privacy laws. Uh, we actually have authorization state attorneys general do under a number of federal statutes to enforce uh, certain privacy laws, such as the Children's Online Privacy Protection Act or uh, HIPAA. State attorneys general can enforce those to the same extent as the relevant uh, federal regulator. And so we've dedicated resources to doing that and we'll be bringing um, enforcement actions and investigations in those uh, under federal laws as well as under um, state laws. Uh, we've also formed uh, an e-crime unit in the office which investigates uh, and prosecutes criminal violations of laws involving technology. But I raise it because uh, this really is the criminal side of privacy intrusions, and that's identity theft uh, as one example. It's the number one complaint the FTC uh, receives, and it's one of the major issues um, that consumers face is identity theft. Well, that's what happens when, a, um, when, when someone without authorization obtains the personal data of a California consumer or any consumer around uh, the country. Uh, we've also, we're, we're pursuing criminal intrusions as well into networks. Um, that would be an example of another way to access personal data. So there are some criminal violations of privacy. Those need to be looked at, and we're doing civil. Uh, in the last year, we uh, announced an agreement uh, around improving privacy practices in mobile apps. Uh, the Attorney General announced that with Amazon, Apple, uh, Google, Hewlett Packard, Microsoft, uh, Research in Motion, and, and later Facebook as well, to uh, allow uh, um, uh, uh, mobile app developers to include their links to their privacy policies in the mobile app store, um, you know, whether it's, you know, it, whichever platform it is, so that consumers could find a privacy policy in the same consistent location for any app in the store, right? You know, if, if without this, uh, a consumer, if an app had a privacy policy, had to go on what I call a treasure hunt, because sometimes the privacy policy was in the settings function, sometimes it was on the first screen, sometimes it was in the website, and then you had to go back and bring that and figure out whether that applied to the mobile app. This allowed it to be in one consistent location, and I actually think, I, I hope Tim would agree with this, that it was developer friendly. And the reason is, uh, it came out of the real estate of the app store, or the app platform. It didn't come out of the developer's you know, real estate in the platform store, they don't get a lot of room to market their apps. 
uh, they get very little room. And so if they had to include all their privacy practices right there, they wouldn't have any opportunity to tell you about what the cool app is that they're doing. And so the platform stepped up there, and we commend them for stepping up to, uh, in their area of the store, to include links to privacy policy. So we were really proud of that. And we saw a dramatic increase in the number of apps that have privacy policies within six months of our agreement. It went you know, from less than 50% of apps having privacy policies to 75 to 80% of apps having privacy policies. It's huge, and that was without suing anyone. That was with partnering with the industry, and we've really tried to partner with industry and to provide guidance to industry about um, what, what are good privacy practices. In January of this year, we released a best practices document for uh, mobile apps that we hoped would basically serve as a toolkit for uh, mobile apps to uh, examine their privacy practices and to take certain basic protections, to provide them with guidance to do this. Uh, the guidance went, went, goes beyond the law, admittedly, but that's what, needed, what was needed because we're trying to get them to aim for best practices, not just what the law absolutely minimally requires you to do, but to aim for greater protections. Uh, and we wrote the document not for lawyers, we wrote it for, for startups, really, for startup app developers. We tried to write it in plain English so that they would be able to pick this up, a developer who's, you know, it might be two or three hoodie-wearing app developers in Palo Alto in a garage that are trying to figure out what do we do about privacy. We can't afford to go out and hire a lawyer. We only have, you know, $50,000 to really try and get our app up and out there. Do we want to spend it on lawyers trying to figure this out? But we wanted to give them some guidance to help them avoid major pitfalls um, and to uh, offer them uh, a, a, really a resource that they could use. So that's been released. It's on our website if anyone would uh, would like to see it. And we're also pursuing enforcement actions. Um, you know, we, we sent out dozens of letters last year to uh, app developers that we thought were not in compliance with California's Online Privacy Protection Act. And we ended up suing Delta Airlines in particular uh, as a result of a failure to include a privacy policy in their mobile app. And we will uh, continue uh, to ensure that California's Online Privacy Protection Act is enforced in the future. Thank you. Uh, and then finally, Tim, a big question. There's this multi-stakeholder process in the NTIA about creating a code for mobile app transparency. I recognize a lot of my friends in the audience from all those meetings. And pretty soon, we're going to be reaching our one-year anniversary. So can you explain what it is and what progress has been made, please? Sure. Uh, thanks, Heather, for the question. So I, I said at the beginning that I thought, and I, I truly believe this, that Consumers and developers are aligned in their interest. And so if you take that as a, as a fact, which I do, what I think is important is how do we go about then as an industry on behalf of developers empowering consumer choices? I tend to think here in Washington and frankly in other state capitals as well that we tend to regulate and think about privacy as a binary question. The people who either love privacy and want a lot of it and people who want to share everything. And the fact of the matter is, is that most of us fall somewhere along a spectrum between those two poles. And I know very few people who share everything, and I know very few people who share nothing. And on top of that, we have to remember that people's choices about when to share data with a developer vary by context. They want to share certain things at certain times to get certain benefits. So one of our goals here is to figure out how we, as a, a group of people who care about privacy, can empower the consumers to choose the apps they want, when they want them, and how they want them. I think that's critically important. So with that in mind, we began a process last year outlined by the Obama administration, uh, convened under the Department of Commerce's uh, NTIA, to engage in a process to think about how we could advance mobile app transparency. Uh, given this opportunity, the Application Developers Alliance, again, aligned with consumers, said, we want to do something that's different, that's better, that allows consumers to make exactly the choices they want to make, to pick exactly the apps they want when they want them. Mm -hmm. And with that insight in mind, we sat down in a big room. It was many people uh, larger than uh, it is now. Uh, and we began to engage in discussion. At times, there, were, there was real acrimony from that process. We had industry groups who didn't want to see anything changed. And we had consumer groups who only believed that heavy-handed regulation could be an answer. But there was a middle way. And it was a, there is a middle way, and it is because there are people who recognize that progress can be made by empowering consumers to make the choices they want to make. So the Application Developers Alliance, I'm proud to say, convened a group of our friends, and strange bedfellows at that, 
people who would never normally would think be in the same room, nor in alignment on uh, these issues, and yet that's exactly what's happened. So we reached out and we spoke with the ACLU, Consumer Action, and in fact my, my good friend Michelle Moy, the Future of Privacy Forum, uh, represented by Heather at the end of the table. Uh, we added other folks along the way into it, has led recently, and as a group in November we launched what we think is a, a true middle path that brings everybody into alignment and has the opportunity to give consumers exactly what it is they want when they want it, which is a short form privacy notice. Something that replaces that 54 page privacy notice that the congressman <coughs> was talking about. And what this is intended to do is at a glance allow for consumers to have an opportunity to answer, have answered two questions about the app that they'd like to use at that moment. One, what data is that app collecting about the individual? And two, what types of third-party entities is the app sharing data with? We can do this all in one screen, and that's the great breakthrough. Literally at a glance, we can, as an industry, present consumers with this amazing new concept of at a glance privacy, where they can understand and make some decisions at the moment about whether that's an app that they want to use at the moment they want to use it. I think that's really critically important. I think we've had incredible buy-in from people. Uh, it is amazing to see that group of strange bedfellows still supporting this activity, working through uh, a series of intense negotiations and discussions with folks around town so that we get all the equities right, so we get all the interests aligned properly. But I am incredibly optimistic at this point, Heather, that we are about to actually be able to launch something that changes the game, that really gives consumers in a short notice uh, what happens mm -hmm. with that app. So again, they make the choices that they want to make and that we as an industry are empowering exactly those choices rather than having regulators or legislators impose certain choices upon them, which I think would be a mistake. Thank you, Tim. That was a great explanation and I'm sure John Verdi would be very proud to heard you say that. Uh, so I'm going to open it up to our panel for a question or two depending on time. But um, So last fall, the California Attorney General publicly tweet use, twi use Twitter to criticize United Airlines for not having a privacy policy in their mobile app. This was a groundbreaking example of using <coughs> social media as a way to regulate the mobile app space. So how do you see examples such as this, or social media in general, affecting future regulatory and industry efforts when it comes to mobile privacy? It's for anyone to answer, but I was kind of staring at Travis. <laughs> um, it, it, it was groundbreaking. And uh, I remember, you know, at, we've all seen uh, lots of elected officials use social media, um, and in particular Twitter as well as Facebook, mm -hmm. to express their disgruntlement with uh, a particular company. Uh, typically, when it comes to airlines, it's an elected official who's sitting on a plane somewhere, and they've got a delay, or someone hasn't treated them appropriately, mm -hmm. and they send off uh, a message. Um, it was different because the attorney general, when she sent the message, actually complimented them first. She said, fabulous app. I like, you know, yeah. fabulous app, but where's your privacy policy? Right, and I think that uh, social media has opened up access to uh, different new ways to communicate with companies and also to raise awareness around issues. And sometimes raising awareness is really the goal, you know. And, you know, shortly thereafter, uh, United Airlines had a privacy policy. Um, and uh, it, I think, served its purpose without necessarily having to file a lawsuit. Um, invoke the courts, uh, invoke a bunch of lawyers, cost a lot of money, it, it arrived at the same um, result and it was transparent. And privacy policies in particular are fundamentally about transparency. I think that we you know, have certainly seen regulators before use social media. Uh, I think we'll see it in the future as the technology changes and as companies are evolving in their business practices and use of social media, government too has to keep up. It too has to embrace and recognize that, that the way we do business as government and as regulators has to change. And that's necessarily the case because the technology that we're talking about is evolving so rapidly. When you think about the mobile space, it was only in 2007 that we got the first iPhone. 
That's barely six years ago, the first iPhone. In 2008, I think, Apple and Google launched their uh, platform stores with 500 apps. In five years, six years, we're now at a million apps. The amount of time that it takes to get a law through the legislature, whether it's at the state level or at the federal level, when you think about coming up with a concept for it, identifying the problem, sending it through committees, getting it passed by you know, both houses, getting it signed into law, getting the necessary regulations uh, promulgated, finally getting to a point where you can begin to enforce those, against, that's a four or five year process to get through all of that. The technology, though, changes so much in that time that it's outdated if you begin to, you know, begin to limit yourself to literally using the traditional tools of regulation, namely administrative enforcement, legislation, and litigation. They take too long. And so government, I think, has to be innovative in its approach to regulation and in its thought process. And, and that's kind of what you saw from the congressman a minute ago with the, the website that they have to sort of develop legislation. It's thinking about it differently. It's the same thing that's happening through NTIA. It's thinking about how can we approach regulation of industry practices when it comes to these rapidly evolving sectors in new and different ways. And I think that's what you saw with the Attorney General's use of social media. And I think that for government to continue to be a relevant regulator, we will continue to have to think differently about the way we regulate. I just wanted to respond yep. to that. I think um, the way that they handled that was wonderful. I think it was it was really great, a great way to reach the public also because, you know, I think as more and more people become engaged on these issues, more and more companies pay attention. Um, it's, it's also having that sort of looming um, threat that helps. So, you know, I have a lot of issues with self-regulation, but that said, I'm also involved in this NTAA process because I believe that the, the problem of how quickly these things move in technology is a big one. Um, also, that being said, I think that it's on the White House in particular to come up with a baseline consumer privacy bill. And I think that's something that, you know, they're hopefully working on, but I think that is also important. Um, you know, it's in Europe, they, they have that sort of, um, those sorts of regulations and laws, and, and it works. You know, there are issues, of course, but I think the United States, and in fact, the United States is the only, one of the only democracies, civilized um, places in the world that doesn't have a baseline privacy law. And that makes no sense to me. So I think while using all of these different tools is, is of course important and much faster. It's also, I think, critical to have a baseline law in the country too. I mean, our, I, I think it's one of the greatest case studies in, in social media being a corrective force, exactly what we were talking about before, in the marketplace regulating itself in this instance and driving uh, a privacy policy into an app that does capture a lot of personal information. Um, you know, those are the kinds of, of instances where you look at the marketplace and you say it, it works. And, uh, you know, I, for one, um, really believe that it's important to allow this process to play out. At the same time, the way that uh, California is working today, helping guide certain aspects of the industry in certain directions, but allow the industry to evolve, allow it to, um, you know, become and innovate and do all the things that, uh, that are really uh, building momentum behind um, a lot of the things that we see happening in media and marketing today. And, and that's, that to me is what's, what's really uh, most exciting and what's most critical about these issues. And um, I think uh, the idea of legislating certain things at this point of the game is a bit premature as we go through this process. Can I say one more thing? Um, I, I met with a bunch of developers a year or two ago, and I felt like that was really important to talk to the people who were actually making these things. And I, they echoed exactly what Tim said, which is that a lot of, for example, a lot of developers come from an open source background and really value privacy themselves and a, a, as sort of a public value. So, um, you know, I think that's, I think, I don't want to say um, be directly belligerent, <laughs> so I'll try to be nice. But I think that, the problem with the industry, and so I, I separate out developers because the NTIA process has shown that, that that ethos is really there. But when I think about some of the other players in the industry, including advertisers and marketers, that is not the case. And it's been extremely difficult to not only get information from these companies, but also to extract some of the promises that they've made. For example, the White House 
um, you know, was it was together with the DAA. They promised to have something on Do Not Track by by January, and they haven't fulfilled that because there's no pressure. Um, the W3C is, has convened a body to really look at Do Not Track to try to define the standards for it, and a lot of industry, in my opinion, have really torpedoed that effort. So while I think these self-regulatory processes can work. In the W3C case, you see a really struggling process. And even in the NTIA case, case, there's a struggling process. So I think government has got to step up to the plate a little bit more and force some of these companies to not just sort of threaten them, but force them to comply with um, transparency, with some basic FIPS, data minimization, data retention, all these sorts of things. I think that's, that's another place where the government um, can and should step in. Well, on that note, I think we only have maybe two minutes left, and I will open it up to the audience if they'd like to respond to any of our panelists. Yes? Well, I have a question and kind of a comment. You know, it's, it's commented on the panel that you know, the U.S. is the only country without a baseline privacy legislation, except that the U.S. is also the only country in the world that truly has a genuinely economically successful tech sector in that the majority of European states, et cetera, do not have the homegrown tech sector rely on many of the U.S. companies to provide those services because, because it's difficult to enter those markets. And so when you're talking about a baseline privacy legislation, there's something to be said for the fact that we have been successful and have been able to innovate under the structure we have today. And so my question is, what would a baseline privacy legislation actually address? What is what is the actual harm that's trying to be drawn? Because I've heard a lot of comments about um, identity theft and really questions of data security, which are not privacy Who wants to attack that one? I'm happy to. I don't want to talk too much. Um, so if anybody else wants to jump in. I mean, I don't want to repeat some of the stuff I said before, but the inferences, the web lining, that stuff is real, and it goes on all the time. Um, I think when you're talking about Europe and, and what could be done here, you know, like I said, the FIPS really represent a model that is universally agreed to be something that protects both data security and privacy. You know, I think the idea that the only reason to protect privacy is because, you know, we need X, Y, Z harm, and, and of course I can provide that, but the fact, it's also a fundamental right here in the United States and something that should therefore be protected. You know, I do understand the, the issues with companies here and that this is a robust economy and it's a great driver of, of the economy. And I, you know, having worked in the sector, I don't, I don't have anything against advertising or marketing or any of that stuff. What I have a problem with is the fact that consumer expectations don't line up with practices. And not only is that a transparency issue, that's a business problem, you know, because, like I said before, innovation comes through privacy. Trust is the core of that. And I think, and studies have shown actually, there was one fairly recently that showed that people are shying away from using mobile apps and other types of services because of their fear of privacy risks. Photo sharing, um, you know, other things like that where people are starting to learn that there are geotags and other issues in there. They're feeling tricked and they're feeling worried that their information is going to be collected without their knowledge, which in fact it is being. So, you know, I think there's a way to do it that, that doesn't hinder that sort of innovation. And in fact, I think business needs to continue, like sort of the ADA, step up to the plate and say, okay, let's, let's figure out something that works for everybody. All right, one more question. Uh, who wants to take it between the two of you? You guys can battle it out. I just want to. I just want to say yes. one thing. Just what we were just talking about a, a minute ago, when you talk about inferences, and we and we're talking specifically about advertising. In a lot of the applications or apps that are the most trusted out there, that are using uh, geolocation, that are uh, sharing photos, that are that are doing all these things, there there is an understanding, and there actually is an opt-in at the beginning of any of those kinds of applications for doing those things. In the advertising world, you know, one of the things I think we conveniently forget is this notion of a value exchange, and the fact that at the end of the day, somebody needs to pay for these things. So 
whether it's creation of apps, whether it's the creation of content or services or anything like that, Advertising has been the backbone of paying or underwriting a lot of these services in communications, in media, uh, since the advent of modern media. And so, you know, what we're trying to do today is really, I'd say, build a, a set of best practices mm -hmm. that uh, are making it so uh, it solves two fundamental issues. Number one, consumers hate getting irrelevant ads. We all know that. Uh, and number two, marketers hate wasting their money sending consumers irrelevant ads. And there's technologies today that enable that uh, to be solved at a deeper level. It's going to continue to evolve. It's evolving at an incredibly rapid pace. It's an incredibly exciting time. And for me, it would be um, a shame to see uh, that stifled in any way. And, and I want to comment on the previous question as well, uh, because I, I don't want to prescribe which should be a baseline set of privacy protections, but there are issues that I can identify that seem like they need an answer to them, and a consistent answer across the country, uh, not just in particular areas within it. Uh, one of those issues that comes to mind is how information, uh, personal data that's collected can be shared, and with whom and for what purposes. In other words, can information that I share with Facebook, just to give an example, be used to determine whether or not I'm entitled to credit for a mortgage? Um, should it be used to determine whether or not I am uh, able to take a particular job for employment purposes? Uh, how can you use the information? That's one thing that comes to mind. Another one is about retention of data, which is to say, if I share information today, how long can a company keep that information after I'm no longer a customer? You know, once I'm gone, can they keep it and use it for whatever purpose they want in perpetuity? Or should there be some natural expiration? Again, I'm not prescribing the solution, but I recognize that there are issues there. And for me, this is important because privacy should be linked to data security. It, in fact, it is in my mind, and it should be linked to cybersecurity as well, ultimately. Uh, because the fact is, as the personal data is collected by a company, um, when that information is breached, then we're, you know, all the consumers are at risk. And nowadays, particularly when it comes to things like passwords, a lot of people use the same password for multiple websites. When one, or you know, multiple uses, when that's breached one time, then suddenly someone that's got your email address and your password has the ability to access all kinds of, not only websites, but possibly even your access to your employer's uh, networks as well. And that, those are real risks. To everyone. So I actually think that privacy, data security, cybersecurity are all linked, and I would like to see the conversation recognize that privacy is not just about civil liberties and social justice, but it's actually also a security measure that's meant to protect us not only from uh, threats abroad, but for our physical safety as well, depending upon the information that's breached. You know, you've, if you know where someone's movements are every day for the last year, you can begin to predict where they're going to be in the future. Those are real risks to people um, as well. So I would hope that we can transition the discourse from, so, from liberty, civil liberties and social justice towards security. Well, on that note, I hope you all tweeted how much you enjoyed this panel. <laughs> and thank our panelists for a great hour on mobile privacy. And on to the next. Please.